Hello. Good, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, WSIS forum. Uh, while we wait for all the, the uh, attendees to join us this afternoon, um, we'd like to uh, show you a, a short video on uh, WSIS. And again, thank you and welcome. A multi-stakeholder United Nations Summit, the World Summit on the Information Society Forum, 2021 was initiated in January and will culminate in the final week held from the 17th to the 21st of May. Representing the largest gathering of the ICT for Development community globally, WISIS provides a platform for those using information and communication technologies to promote sustainable development, highlighting the role of the WISIS action lines to achieve the sustainable development goals. So far, over 10,000 participants have joined and over the 120 virtual workshops featured directly through Zoom, through Facebook Live, or other applications. Shaped through more than 500 inputs and suggestions received from our stakeholders during the open consultation process, the agenda of the WISIS Forum features a weekly program with exciting workshops and sessions based on thematic areas deemed as important by our stakeholders. We're delighted to see well-balanced contribution in terms of geographical location, gender balance, and stakeholder type, which has shown the positive commitment towards the WISIS process and the strengthening of the WISIS implementation of activities to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. The agenda and program of the WISIS Forum cover all the action lines and are aligned with the SDGs. Some of the thematic areas addressed, known as special tracks, include ICTs and gender mainstreaming, ICTs and older persons, ICTs and accessibility for persons with disabilities and specific needs, cybersecurity, and many more, all of which are available on the 2021 WISIS Forum website. The WISIS Forum 2021 also features a high-level track which gathers high-level representatives from various sectors with ministers, deputies, ambassadors, heads of regulatory bodies, private sector, civil society, academia, and the technical community to discuss the role of ICTs as a means of the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals and Targets. The 2021 WISIS Chairman, His Excellency Mr. Maxime Parshin, and the High-Level Track Facilitators will provide an executive summary of the high-level track outcomes during the final week of the forum, sharing the emerging trends, challenges, and opportunities noted by the diverse group of high-level track facilitators through the course of the high-level policy sessions. The sectoral, regional, and gender diversity of our stakeholders is also displayed in our virtual exhibition space that was inaugurated on March 15th, as well as our various social media platforms. We invite you to follow the WISIS process on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for regular updates and exciting news about the forum, such as the fact that we received a record number of submissions for the WISIS prizes this year, with over 1,270 projects submitted and 1.3 million votes that were cast for the 360 nominated projects. Visit the WISIS prize website to learn more, with the 18 winners being announced during the 18th of May during the special ceremony. We are also pleased to announce that the WISIS Forum special track on ICTs and older persons will be initiating a special prize this year entitled the WISIS Healthy Aging Innovation Prize. Additionally, in collaboration with the Global Coalition on Aging, WISIS is co-organizing a virtual hackathon. With more than a thousand registered participants, the hack will continue until April. Hackers had the opportunity to meet with experts in the field of ICTs and aging during the three mentorship sessions featured. Stay tuned for the announcements of the four winners decided by a distinct panel of judges and announced on May 17th during the final week of the 2021 WISIS Forum. We look forward to your participation and thank stakeholders for their contribution in shaping this year's WISIS Forum with ongoing commitment and support. We would also like to extend a warm thank you to our partners, without whom this forum would not be possible. Thank you, and we look forward to a successful WISIS Forum 2021. Thank you very much. Um, I hope you all had the time to uh, connect and uh, I hope the sound and the video is, uh, is good. So uh, welcome to this uh, forum. Uh, today we're going to be discussing about how we can join forces in an uh, innovative new device financing program. And the ambition is to make 4G even more affordable for emerging markets. And today we're going to talk specifically around Pakistan. Next. So um, the, the themes that we are going to address today are the following. We're going to talk about how we can address the migration from 2G to 4G 
and why there's a need to address this migration. We're going to talk about more specifically a pilot project of device financing that we are setting up all together, all the members of this panel here in Pakistan. And we're going to show how this regional cooperation and coordinated efforts have been able to drive digital inclusion in Pakistan. And more widely, we're going to talk about how this program is impacting society and more importantly, how we can make this program scalable. So the agenda, we're gonna go through a, a quick opening and introduction. We're gonna be addressing the challenges. Um, we're gonna be addressing uh, the issues being faced by uh, Digital Pakistan, and more importantly, how the first time internet users are facing problems in the migration from 2G to 3G and 4G. Um, we're going to be talking about device price trend and usage behavior. And more importantly, we're going to be also talking about how the regulator can help accelerate this migration program. We're going to be also talking about nano financing. What are the strategies, the impacts, and how coordinated efforts can make this device financing happen? Um, and this is particular interest and especially important in the context where many of the customers may be lacking a credit rating and proper credit history. We're gonna be talking about how to scale and how we can reach out to 2G users and make sure those device financing program can actually reach full-scale deployments. And at the end of the session, we're gonna have a wrap-up and an open Q&A session. So um, I'd like to give the opportunity to each one of the panelists uh, who have uh, accepted to be here today to introduce themselves. So we're going to start from uh, uh, left to right on this on this panel. So um, we're going to start with Mr. Asif Aziz. Please, if you could introduce yourself. I think you're on mute, uh, Asif. Asif, I think you're on mute. Yes. My apologies, the computer's a bit slow here. Sorry, thank you very much for that introduction, Nicola. My name is Asif Aziz from Jazz in Pakistan. Jazz is a leading mobile operator here, serving almost 70 million subscribers. Um, Abdul? Mr. Abdul Rahman, can you hear us? Yeah, sorry. Thank you very much, Nicholas. My name is Abdul Rahman, and uh, I'm the founder of Digit, which is a disruptive mobile devices brand in Pakistan. We have been working in different areas, including mobile broadband devices, and especially the affordable 4G mobile phones. Uh, Dr. Kawa? Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be uh, the part of this session. Uh, my name is Dr. Khawar Sadi. Uh, I am currently uh, working in Pakistan Telecommunication Authority as member enforcement and compliance. I have worked here uh, before as a member technical from 2009 to 13. So uh, Pakistan Telecommunication Authority is a regulator. We are responsible uh, for regulating the IT and telecom industry of Pakistan. And uh, Mr. Kaman. Hi, good afternoon. Um, my name is Kamran Zuberi, and I'm representing Finja Lending Services. Finja is a digital lending platform with an integrated payments ecosystem focused on the financial wellness of businesses, individuals, and their partners. And uh, lastly, I will introduce myself. So I'm uh, Nicholas Zibel. I'm the Chief Business Officer of KaiOS. KaiOS is an operating system uh, that uh, supports uh, smart feature phones, and it is at the, at the heart of this revolution from 2G to 4G migration by providing affordable devices uh, that are uh, actually enabling the access to digital services uh, for a, a new area of the population. So that's uh, very exciting and you will understand better throughout this panel how this works and what we've put together to make it happen. So um, thank you everyone. Um, so what we, we're going to, to do now is we're going to, uh, to set a couple of uh, rules, but before we begin, so everyone will be set on mute. If you have questions, make sure you can go into the Q&A feature uh, and ask your questions in the Q&A. Um, and at the end of these, this panel, there will be a full Q&A, so we'll answer your questions. And 
and on a separate channel, if you're facing any technical issue, whether it's streaming, audio, or you cannot hear any one of us, uh, or there's something uh, going wrong, please use the chat feature. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna spend a few minutes before we get into the, the heart of our discussion to give you a little bit of a, a background around accessibility. So as we know in the past 10 years, broadband coverage has made a huge progress. Now, <clears throat> the, the population is widely covered at least with 3G, but now LTE 4G is covering at least 69% of the population as of 2020. Now, this being said, the reality is that still half of the world's population is not using internet. As, as we know, some is by choice, but, but in most cases, this is because people cannot afford it because it's too expensive. So roughly 2 billion people today are still using feature phones. Um, in emerging markets, smartphones are too expensive. It's been uh, calculated by A4I, which is a, a, um, a, an association which is specifically looking at affordability of devices, that it requires around $14 per day uh, to be able to afford a smartphone. And if you look at uh, population in some emerging markets, in some cases, the percentage of the population not being able to afford a smartphone is actually very high because um, uh, a, a big part of this population actually lives with more um, about $8 a day or less. So developing smart feature phone is actually a strategic tool for the 4G migration. And we believe is one of the most fundamental tools to be able to enable the next billion users their access to internet. So the smart feature phone, and we'll talk a lot about uh, this device is actually a device which is exactly in between a basic phone uh, that is sometimes called a feature phone, which is usually a 2G, has no internet, but has the merits of being affordable and simple, and a smartphone that we know well, which is 3G, 4G, and now 5G. And one of the issues is that it's usually expensive and in some cases complex to use. In the case of the smart feature phone, we're talking about a 4G device which offers most of the internet capabilities and on top of it is affordable, robust, and simple. So what we, we're going to talk about now, uh, as we see the, the price sensitivity around uh, um, uh, devices, and the, the, a couple of dollars can make the whole difference be, between being able to afford a device and not being afford a device. Um, I'd, I'd like to spend just a few minutes to explain what we see as being uh, the key elements that are being put in place to reduce the upfront cost of the device. So uh, since the mobile industry has existed, the number one uh, tool has been operator subsidy. And in many cases, operators, operators are subsidizing uh, 4G devices, but this works well only in those markets where the carriers control most of the channel and most of the distribution. And of course, it depends on the, the subsidies available and it's not a mass solution for migration. The second solution that is being used, obviously, is to sell 4G devices in open market. Um, but here, there are some limitations specifically related to the fact that uh, it is in competition with 2G devices and there's still a significant cost gap between a 4G uh, device, which, whether it's a smart feature phone or a, or, or a smartphone and a basic phone. Uh, the third element that has started to be implemented is a device financing, which is led by third party fintechs. And usually um, these fintechs have started addressing uh, the higher end of the market. Um, but the consequence of, of, of this is that the monthly repayment for the end user is sometimes unaffordable. Um, so what we, uh, we are aiming at here is to find a solution where the monthly repayment is actually affordable for the users and therefore where the monthly repayment is actually very close to their monthly uh, repayment bill. And that's uh, the aim of, of this discussion is how we've made 
uh, this discussion possible. We have to discuss around, um, around these issues, but we have to be aware that there are today three major challenges. One is um, that 2G devices are very low cost and uh, that this creates problems. In some markets, there's also gray market, not in the case of, of Pakistan anymore, but there is some gray market happening, which uh, create a, an unbalanced competition. In many cases, the users or the consumers are lacking uh, credit rating and uh, lacking credit history. Um, and in, um, in the many circumstances, there is a lack of a uh, focus of fintechs to address this very part of the market where there is a huge volume potential, but each customer is sometimes uh, not the, uh, the most lucrative for the fintechs. So the, the real challenge here is how we can combine an affordable device with a situation where there is an understanding of the customer's credit and there is a, a focus of channeling the resources to address those markets. So now we'll, I will start asking uh, questions to um, our panelists and I would like to, uh, to start with, uh, with, with Dr. Kavar uh, from, the, from the PTA, if he could give us uh, some elements uh, and especially explain the role of the PTA in the Digital Pakistan program. Thank you very much. PTA has always, uh, I mean, facilitated the digital transformation and we have done uh, everything possible, uh, which was in our domain. So in, in this context, uh, if we look at the subscriber base, we still have uh, 84 million uh, 2G subscriber and we have 25 million 3G subscriber and we have approximately uh, 70 million uh, 4G subscribers. So if we look at these statistics, so we still have a, uh, I mean, great room to transform um, 84 million 2G subscriber into the 4G subscriber. PTA especially has uh, recently approved issuance of uh, 12 mobile manufacturing licenses. Before the issuance of these mobile manufacturing licenses, we had almost uh, 33 mobile companies, they were either assembling um, in portion some of the features phones, and we had very few 4G manufacturing uh, 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 industry now. And recently, uh, we, with the uh, incentive of Ministry of Industries, um, the policy directive was issued by the Ministry of Industries, whereby PTA had been authorized to issue the uh, authorization or licenses for the manufacturing of 2G, 3G or 4G sets. And we have approved recently 12 licenses. I hope with the issuance of uh, these uh, 12 licenses, the manufacturing of 4G phones will increase. At the same time, government has issued incentive uh, because at the moment, a, a, a phone set that is going to cost from $350 to $500 there would be no duty on local manufacturing. So if there is a no duty on local manufacturing, so approximately a reasonable mobile phone is a, can be made available in Pakistan, like uh, $200, $300. So with the local manufacturing, the price of the mobile phone are going to go down. Obviously there would be some custom duty on those high-end phones, but probably high-end phones, uh, if we look at the statistics, most of the people uh, can purchase a local manufacturing phone. So that step Pakistan has, uh, Pakistan Telecommunication Authority has taken. On top of that, if we need to encourage the local manufacturing, so we have to, sp to stop the, those phones which are coming through illegal channels. So in order to carry out this process, Pakistan Telecommunication Authority has developed a DEV system, which is device identification, registration, and blocking system. The main feature of, of this derb is any phone which, which has come into Pakistan through illegal channel that will be blocked. Any other substandard phone uh, would be blocked and cologne phone would be blocked. Any phone um, which do not meet the technical standard that phone be blocked. So if we are blocking all those phones which are coming through the legal channel so obviously the price of the phone would be regulated and local industry would be encouraged to manufacture uh, low cost low cost telephones. So that is the step which Pakistan telecommunication has 
authority has taken. On top of that, with the implementation of DERB system, the type approval process type approval process has been automated and we can issue type approval certification within two to uh, with, within two to three hours before that i mean any importer which was importing a telephone from the overseas had to go through a process of submitting documents visually and getting a certificate of compliance from the pta and getting clearance from the custom authority it's going to take like uh, it was taking 12 days 13 days 14 days so that process has been expedited with the implementation of a derp and the whole process can be completed within two to three hours so that step pakistan telecommunication authority has been has has taken with the implementation of the derp type approval certificate issuance has been expedited so before it used to take like three four days now we can expedite this process we can even issue a type approval certification within within one day provided the technical specifications are met so if we have expedited all those processes that is going to encourage the import of phone through legal channels and if we stop the illegal channel that mean the not only the revenue of the government of pakistan would increase increase but at the same time the local industry would be encouraged to manufacturing the low cost mobile phones so so th these are the two steps which the pakistan telecommunication authority has taken in transforming the 2g segment into the 4g segment obviously some some of the steps we are taking because uh, not only a major of the majority of the population have a issue of uh, affordability of the 4g phones but still there are some population pockets which are not covered with the uh, 4g services though mobile operators have launched 4g services but still uh, with the renewal of the licenses so we have uh, um, included some licensing condition whereby a mobile operator would be required to offer more uh, 4g coverage so we hope that uh, offering of a 4g services in in those population area where there is a lack of service and availability of the uh, affordable mobile phone through local manufacturing would encourage and it would bridge the gap between the transformation of 2G to 4G. Okay, thank you, Dr. Kabra. Um, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Mr. Aziz, uh, a question for you. Um, uh, so you, you uh, represent Jazz here. Can you give us a little bit of a background around the, the number of customers that you have today on 2G and 4G? And uh, what is your 4G coverage of Pakistan? Thank you, Nicholas. Uh, today we are just below 70 million subscribers in total, so uh, which is uh, effectively one in third, one in every three Pakistanis is actually now connected with Jazz. Within that, we probably got about now 29, just over 29 million 4G users. So that's uh, probably a lot less than half of the base is on 4G, and then we have the remainder on to 3G. Safe to say, it probably would be about 50% of the base is on internet, whether it be 3G, 4G, or some degree or 2G. That is not really good enough because that really means a bulk of Pakistan remains unconnected. And uh, what I now observe and I see in our own network is an enormous digital divide arriving. Uh, those living in urban areas tend to be a lot more connected with uh, smartphones but those living in rural areas are getting left behind. And specifically within that, there are specific rural communities, and I'm talking here notably females, women, uh, are under indexing in the use of smartphone and on data. And it doesn't take me to tell you how limiting that can be for an individual and how much damaging that can be to their lifestyle. Um, this corona pandemic has shown the importance of being remaining connected. Uh, so that in itself is a, an enormous challenge for us. With regards to the 4G, almost 87% uh, of our network is now 4G enabled, and we're rolling out 4G sites every particular day. So that will continue till we get to 100%. There is a real challenge here, I have to confess. We do work with the government of Pakistan and their universal service fund to be able to go to the much more rural communities of um, Pakistan in the more expansive des desert areas and in the more difficult terrain of some of the mountainous regions of the north, where quite frankly, there's probably still at least 20 to 25 million people who aren't connected onto the internet. So in a country uh, connected at all to mobile, so in a country of 220 million people, 
there's probably at least 20 million people who are not even able to access these basic services. That, that is, doesn't sound like a lot in the context of Pakistan, but 20 million is, many, is bigger than many countries. So it is incumbent on us to be able to go to those uh, far-fledged areas as well, to be able to cover them as well. What we are noticing though, there is an inflection point arriving. I think now we've seen a greater acceleration and migration to 4G than we have done in any previous year. Last year was a great year from a growth perspective onto 4G. Uh, we've been adding over a million customers onto our 4G network each month. But again, um, at that rate, it will still take us another two years before we can get, every, get to everybody. So we've got a lot of work to do to be able to connect more people to the internet. The unfortunate thing really in this is, my, my challenge isn't getting any easier because whilst we add a good number of 4G every single month, I'm also adding the same equivalent onto 2G as well. So whilst the 4G is growing, regretfully, the 2G isn't shrinking. It's actually still there. So that is the major concern. And from all of the work that I've done here with our customers, uh, different people that I speak to, affordability seems to be one of the major barriers. People get very nervous that if I get onto the internet, my, my uh, balance will run out really quickly or my bill would be sky high. So getting them onto that, and the second thing onto that really is, unfortunately, people pick up a cheap phone for less than three, four dollars, but a smartphone uh, for internet is a lot more expensive and a much, much more considered purchase. So that also prevents them from coming onto the actual 4G service. So 2G is a lot easier migration for most people. 4G really does require them to take a considered step. What, what are the solutions to bridge the gap, Asir? So we've taken the lead here with, uh, uh, with, with a, the 4G digit phone that we've been launching, which has got the KaiOS operating system. And, and on, honestly, we've been actually marketing this to the particular segment that we want to talk to. So we don't want to talk to the, uh, the smartphone segment. It's not for them. So we've been talking about this as a, a button smartphone. So not a complete smartphone, but a button smartphone so that people have some degree of relatability to what they're using today and yet help them to get onto the smartphone uh, scenario. It has to be very easy because people can see a smartphone doesn't have any buttons. It's quite complicated. Literacy rates are low. So people get really nervous. So what we built uh, with uh, Digit as well is a, a very simple operating system using KaiOS. Um, with some inbuilt apps, and it is touchscreen as well, so that actually you can access what you need. And what we're, what we're observing on this one is the actual migration from 2G to 4G is significant. And, and I, by, by I mean, mo most people that I get onto this digit phone uh, is their first 4G connection. For most people, I can disclose that. For most people, it is their first 4G connection. And then what we find is their usage is almost on par with some of the people who use smartphones. So there is an insatiable demand for internet and for data. Uh, I think the barrier is pricing and affordability. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Asif. Um, uh, Abdul, um, I, I have a, a question to, for you because you know the, the market very well, especially the, the device market. How do you see the trend uh, for 4G smartphone prices going over the next months? And how do you see the gap between 2G and 4G devices going? Thank you, Nicholas. So basically, if you see, just like Asif mentioned, smartphone penetration rate in Pakistan is already very low. And one of the main reason behind this is the price. So an entry level basic smartphone a 4G price starts from about uh, $70. And this phone has low life and high after sales costs. For example, if the LCD of this smartphone is broken, it will cost about, say, you know, 25% of the value of the phone. So, you know, a, an, an average reasonable smartphone is usually costing about $100. So it becomes very difficult for a low, uh, low end market segment to afford these phones. 
So the gap between a 2G phone and a 4G smartphone will always remain there. So we have to come up with some unique proposition, just like, you know, Asif has already explained that we have launched Digit Phone in partnership with, uh, uh, with Jazz and KaiOS. So the gap between a 2G and 4G will be, will be a lot and it will remain there always. Thank you very much. Um, I just would like to, to add one comment to uh, what Asif was saying uh, earlier on in terms of usage. Um, you know, uh, when people see what they, he, he called the, this button uh, smartphone, most people would believe that the usage would be low. Actually, it's very surprising to see uh, on, the, on the Jazz network the amount of usage, the amount of streaming, the amount of applications being used. And we're talking about the most common applications as well as local applications. So there's a true engagement. And this is the, 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 the most satisfying part is the, the speed at which this engagement has, has happened on devices. And, and those devices are, are, have, have been uh, provided to customers who never used a device before. And this is very, very encouraging. Um, what I suggest we do now is we shift to the second topic, which is the nano financing topic. And I would like here, uh, 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 um, Asif, again, if you could step in and st explain to us why is uh, consumer financing so important in your strategy to migrate uh, 2G customers to 4G customers? Thank you, Nicholas. So yes, this is vital. Uh, what we've observed is, and we've, we, we've had a few attempts at this. It's not like we're not trying it ourselves as well. We've had a few attempts. What, what we're observing is two things. What, one very important thing is the market in Pakistan is very fragmented. Uh, you have retailers that just sell airtime and only want to deal with airtime. Then you have retailers that actually sell handsets and only want to deal with handsets and, and, the, and the two don't actually meet. So uh, consumers don't really come to operators like they do in other more developed markets to be able to recommend them a handset. They go to the open market or to the generic retailers to be able to um, uh, buy the handset. So that's the first uh, major, major challenge. Then in that challenge then comes the next point is that the actual consumer that we are targeting isn't actually going to these particular retailers because the handset that they're looking for is less than $5, $8. And as Abdul Rahman pointed out, that the smartphone prices start at around the $70 mark. It becomes just not really affordable for an individual. And I really mean it doesn't become affordable. There are many, many people here who, for whom survival, and especially during the current pandemic, uh, with, with the scenario that we've seen, uh, many people are struggling to meet their daily wage so that they can actually eat. So a smartphone is a lot lower on their um, list of things to buy. Okay, now, what can we do in this one? We've tried um, giving customers the ability to buy the phone upfront. Um, so for full price or for a slightly subsidized price, we've allowed them to come and take the handset. The reception has been lukewarm. We've also done another one where we've allowed them to pay us through monthly repayments. And again, we've seen some good success on this one, which allows us to think that actually there is an appetite for the market to be able to allow the customer to spread their payments over six months, seven months or eight months in order to make that uh, smart feature phone more affordable. The challenge isn't once they've got the phone in their hand. Once they've got the phone in their hand, uh, WhatsApp, YouTube, all of the applications, our own Jazz Cash, Jazz TV apps are very, very popular. They really like it. They suddenly understand it and they become converted. It's actually getting them to the door to be able to convert them and as Abdul Rahman said, I think this is a pricing issue, which is where we've tried two models. And now I think we want to expand in a much bigger way from a device financing perspective. Of course, this is a very uh, different market to many mature markets. There's no real credit scoring. There's no recourse if you do not pay your uh, balance back. So we are working with the PTA here to be able to work out a mechanism to be able to use the DERP system to robustly block and uh, recover the investments that we make so that the legitimate people who want to come to the 2G, 4G conversion are not excluded from this. 
And actually there are rogue elements that we can actually exclude from this particular scenario through some sort of robust governance. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to see to Cameron, you, you've not uh, spoken yet, but I think it's very important that uh, as a CEO of Finja, you give us uh, a view of how do you handle the fact that most of the customers that we are addressing here do not have credit history or credit, credit rating, or at least a very limited credit history. How do you tackle this issue? Right, thank you, Nicholas. And uh, I mean, I haven't spoken much, but I've been uh, greatly uh, learning a lot from uh, Asif and Abdul Rahman as well. So, so yes, um, yes, and uh, you know what rightfully has been pointed out with the, by my fellow panelists, uh, there has been a, a, a dearth in the market in terms of uh, credit and uh, um, having or owning a smartphone is uh, obviously very expensive. And uh, yes, a lot of customers that we do service uh, on credit, uh, they do not have a prior credit score. Um, but what the government has made it very um, sort of simplistic is that the issuance of a smart national identity card allows, which is uh, predominantly the, the, the precursor for any banking or any uh, uh, service that you require, you, an individual needs to have that uh, computerized national identity card. So it allows us to actually build the credit score on their behalf. And that's something that what Finja Lending Services as a non-banking financial company is set out in doing. And that is to serve the underserved segment of the economy and lend to that particular segment so that the, those individuals who previously do not have any avenues of borrowing money from uh, conventional means can come in a into the banking net b b you know accessibly uh, can access uh, credit and uh, affordability would go up but we do a lot of credit assessments uh, obviously pre issuing a credit line to any individual and that again is built on our proprietary algorithms uh, that we use in terms of noting the individual's profile and um, again, the exposure that we take is obviously governed by the regulator. Uh, there is a debt burden ratio that we maintain uh, when we are extending a line of credit to any borrower. And um, in line with that, we are okay and we feel comfortable in actually taking that first call in building that individual's credit history. So we don't really uh, you know, take into account that that individual does not have a credit history. We do run the the, the computerized national identity card number through various regulatory checks, such as data check and such as the ECIB, which the, the regulator has already set up uh, on the financial side. And, um, you know, based on no credit history, we don't have an issue. If there is a poor credit history, then yes, that's a red flag. But if uh, an individual does not have a credit history from before and they do qualify in terms of their profile, for a credit score, we we are comfortable in actually extending that line of credit to them. Thank you very much, Kaman. Um, just one more question. Uh, how closely do you need to work with uh, Jazz to make this happen and to improve your knowledge of the customer? Well, it's super important, you see, with, with any partner, it has to be a complete integration whereby extending a line from our side is not you know, for us, we don't consider that to be a bigger challenge as opposed to repayment of that credit. And uh, what, uh, you know, Asif was talking about earlier as well, that we have seen great success in terms of breaking down that payment into equal monthly installments. Now, to ensure that those equal monthly installments are coming in, that's where the challenge comes in. Obviously, we don't have access to that um, individual's uh, telephone. We don't have access to the mobile number, uh, mo mobile phone. So locking that mobile phone at a time when he or she is not making good on their equal monthly installments is very important. And with a telco such as Jazz, that partnership actually uh, fulfills where the telco is able to lock or A, I mean, A, lock it or B, track the individual where they are in terms of uh, accessing them for a recovery should they be delinquent on their credit line. Thank you. We, we all heard how important it was to have the support from the regulator. So uh, Dr. Kavar, could you give us uh, the position of the PTA concerning device financing? And um, how do you see uh, this as being an, an important part of uh, the strategy to, uh, to the migration into, uh, into 4G? 
Yeah, we still feel, I mean, there is an uh, element of affordability uh, in respect of the 4G phones, and there is a segment of a population which cannot afford, I mean, 4G phones. It's a, I mean, it's a good initiative, and uh, we will encourage um, either operators or an, any other entity which is willing to provide mobile phones on uh, installment basis, we can block those phones. But the issue is, I mean, the authority has to work within the uh, act and within the regulation. So at the moment, uh, we can block block any stolen phone, anybody, I mean, uh, who request us that his phone has been stolen, that can be blocked. But at the moment, if anybody owns the phone, because the issue with, I mean, we have received a request from different operator, uh, they want to handle this process, uh, I mean, in a two to three, uh, into two to three, three steps. Um, if, I mean, for us, there's no issue, we can block a phone if that phone is owned by any operator. Any operator, if provides a phone to subscriber, and if the ownership of a phone remains with the mobile operator, so that they can request us to block the phone, and we are going to block that phone very immediately. I mean, there's no issue for that. But there are some policy issues, because some of the operators have requested Pakistan Telecommunication Authority, if, I mean, there is a default on part of a customer, the SIM should be blocked. I mean, blocking is a SIM for uh, all the mobile connection, I mean, little bit, it has some challenges because we technically view that it's a commercial agreement between any entity which is providing a, a phone set to the, uh, to the customer. So before providing a phone, I mean, it's a credit history has to be checked. I mean, on part of, uh, on part of the, the one entity, either it's a mobile operator or any um, any company which is providing a phone on installment basis. But for us, I mean, as long as the ownership lies with the um, commercial entity, we can block a phone. So we have taken, taken up these initiatives and we are working to have a policy direction from the government of Pakistan, whereby either we can block uh, a SIM, because at, at the moment we cannot block a SIM. We don't have any mandate to block a SIM if there has been a a disagreement or there has been a violation in terms of a commercial agreement between mobile operator or anybody which is providing a phone to the customer on the basis of installment. So if we get some, some policy direction from the government of Pakistan, we can do that. But at, at this point in time, we cannot do that. Plus we have, uh, we have uh, submitted all those recommendations and we have forwarded these recommendations to the ministry so that we can get an appropriate policy direction. But obviously we will encourage and we will facilitate and we are happy. I mean, this, if, if this, I mean, this on part of either mobile operator or on part of any private company who is willing to provide a phone, they provide phone and installment. We will encourage, we will facilitate. But currently if we see, I mean, uh, some of the mobile companies, they are providing these phones on installment at a, not full level at a low level. I mean, they, they provide and uh, they can block that uh, that phone on their own network. But the issue is they want us to block a total SIM. I mean, if, if the phone is not on their network and if if anyone purchases a phone on installment from Jazz, if he's a defaulter, so that phone Jazz can block. But if he's a defaulter, that if any mobile operator asks us that this phone should be blocked on another network, so that is a little bit challenge at the moment. And we are working on this one on positive basis. And hopefully after this policy direction comes from the government, this can materialize. But at the moment, PT has no objection. If any, any private company, if any of the mobile operator, they provide a phone and installment. And if the ownership is still lies with the mobile operator or a company and they request us to block this phone under the stolen devices, we can block that phone. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Takawa. Um, we, are, we are a little bit uh, short on time, so I will uh, switch to the next topic, uh, which is very important, is all of this makes sense only if we can scale. So how do we address the, uh, the, the scale-up issue? And I'd like to, to, to shift here the, uh, the, the, the microphone to, um, to Digit to give us a little bit of a, a view on how does Digit manage the distribution and the capability to scale a, a program like the, uh, the the one that we are putting in place with the device financing. So uh, Nicholas, basically, uh, we currently see we have you know a couple of different options for distribution that we are adopting. Uh, one is the franchise model, 
So uh, in, in case of Jazz, particularly, we, they have about 400 franchise network who along with their, you know, retail network altogether become probably, you know, more than 20,000 outlets. So one way is to actually, you know, make use of these outlets. And that this is what we are currently doing in case of our existing, you know, device financing program. However, uh, I believe that if we have to reach to the masses around the country in every corner, we need to engage the distributors. We have already, you know, partnered with some of the distributors and we are going into the basically what we call the mobile phone market uh, with these operators, uh, with these distributors. And I personally think that even the device financing program, if we have to convert these 80 million people, these 80 million 2G people, I repeat, then we need to have these distributors on board who can actually take us to every corner of the country. Otherwise, uh, frankly, we cannot scale up too, too quickly that we all want to. And uh, if, you, if you see today, um, I think about more than, or you know, you, almost 100% of the phones are practically you know, sold through the mobile phone markets. They're not sold at, at, the, uh, at the mobile operator you know, outlets. So the major, uh, you know, customer inflow is in the mobile market, in the mobile shops. So we have to reach there. We have to ensure that our device financing program is run at all these shops. And this is where we would be able to actually, you know, uh, to, to fulfill our dream of, uh, you know, connecting every, uh, you know, um, every individual in, in far from uh, rural areas uh, to to uh, to connect to the digital world, so we need to bring on the distributors more and more of them, and uh, we need to you know uh, make our uh, technical uh, solution viable in a way that they can ensure that the device financing program can be run at and uh, at every mobile outlet. Okay, thank thank you, Abdul. Uh, Asif, um, I'm sure that the cost of data and the capability to have data plans that are suited to this migration program is critical to success. Can you give us a bit of a background of how you see data and the data pricing and data usage in this context? Sure, Nicholas. So Pakistan is already one of the lowest priced data markets in the world. Um, the average revenue per subscriber in Pakistan on a weighted average mean basis across the country is probably um, maybe a dollar fifty, less than two dollars. So we are, a, you know, per month. So and for that, the average mean average usage on some of the other products that we have in this is in excess of five gigabytes, which gives you an idea of the sort of level of pricing. I don't believe the actual usage pricing itself is the is an enormous barrier because I'm sure people could afford to spend, uh, and I'm talking about fifty to sixty dollar cents worth of money on to be able to get access to the data. However, with the product that we sell right now, it comes bundled in with immediate availability of free WhatsApp, um, some other free Facebook as well. We also give some free airtime. And uh, in the packaging that we have right now, when the customer subscribes to us every particular month, as they uh, pay off their installment, they get an inclusive amount of free data as well, up to two gigabytes of data as well, which at the moment seems to be honestly not enough. Um, there is an insatiable demand here. Uh, people are really uh, latching onto it. So it, it just leads me to the point that says that Pakistan is at a tipping point. Yes, we've talked about the numbers, less than 100 million people are using data. Uh, we are at an inflection point where we can actually materially change this and I think making the device more affordable and getting into more hands, as Abdul Rahman was talking about, through the various distribution is what is actually needed. So actually the usage itself is secondary, but actually it's getting them to psychologically get over. Instead of paying $10 for a phone, getting them to commit to a $40 phone or a $70 smartphone, that's the biggest mental barrier uh, we have here today. The option to take a $10 phone is still there. And if I was to do anything, I would probably stop the import of 2G phones. I would definitely look at stopping things like that. I believe that everybody should be getting onto the digital uh, services right now. I don't think it's, I, I don't even think it's a, uh, an essential. I think we're in a broadband emergency. Half of our population is not connected onto the internet. So 
How are they going to disperse cash? Then comes all of the other options of mobile financial services to be able to get uh, entertainment. There isn't much entertainment in Pakistan, not in the evenings. There's no cinemas. There's nowhere to go. So most people's entertainment is actually their handsets. And so it is important that we actually drive this. And I believe this can also support much of the government vision on digital Pakistan. The more people that we get connected, uh, the quicker we can accelerate the digital Pakistan uh, vision. Pakistan was very late into the data market. Data only arrived here in 2013 in the, in the term of 3G and 4G really only started to emerge probably about 2015. So we're significantly behind, but we're catching up very, very fast. In just five years, we've managed to, you know, with the support of PTA, we've managed to put on more than 80 million 4G subscribers. So we can grow very, very quickly. But now we're getting to the point whereby we've got all the low hanging fruit. We now need to go to the long tail. And in order to get to the long tail, um, we have to make them get the leap of faith that this is important for you. And I think that leap of faith is, should I pay $10 or should I pay $40? And it's just getting them over that barrier that, that I think is gonna require a little bit more work and scale. Okay, thank, thank, thank you very much, Asif. Uh, one more question before we get into the, the Q&A session. And here I'd like to ask uh, Kamran again, his view. Uh, how difficult is it for you to scale up a program like this? And more specifically, how difficult is it to find the funds to, to finance uh, these customers? And what has been your experience in, uh, in finding the funds for low-income customers? Well, not at all. Actually, funding is not, uh, you know, the bigger challenge uh, at all. And, um, you know, subsequent to, uh, you know, all the lending that we have done so far, which is north of $10 million in the last uh, 18 months, uh, not all for consumer lending. Uh, there's predominantly a lot of B2B lending as well. But, uh, you know, there are plenty of institutions, financial institutions that are looking to partner up, uh, you know, uh, to set up a uh, a platform and that's what we are we are a lending platform so we are open to partnering up with existing financial institutions our existing uh, vcs are uh, very gung-ho on consumption lending in pakistan and, um, and and yeah so i mean funding is not that big an issue i think what's more important here is creating the right partnerships building the right credit scores and and finding again a, partners to collect. And uh, historically, we have uh, partnered up with uh, not just uh, banks uh, within the country, we also <laughs> partnered up with various logistical concerns who collect on our behalf, uh, as far as, uh, you know, monthly repayments are concerned. So, so yeah, so I mean, you know, for, for scaling in consumption lending, it's not that the funding is not much of a challenge as much as uh, allocating the right credit scores and uh, collection of those uh, of those uh, loans. Perfect. Um, as we are getting close to our Q and A session, uh, I'd like to ask every one of the the panelists to give a, a one to two minute conclusion on this panel. So uh, maybe we can start with uh, Dr. Kabra and then uh, Asif. I think uh, uh, the best approach to, I mean. Uh, transformation from 2G to 4G phone would be that there should be more uh, commercial entities. They should come up with the offering of installments to subscriber. Moreover, uh, what, what can be done, I mean, immediately is that operator should start offering mobile phone on installment because really um, the issue is at this point in time is that mobile mobile phone companies they don't i mean really advertise too much and uh, they need to have uh, not only packages but they need to have attractive installment plans so that they can offer through their franchisee they have got big network of franchisee and instead that people should go to uh, different shops and substandard shops they can come to mobile operator and they can have their attractive pricing so that uh, they can have phone on installment so at this point the mobile operator can can play a major role. If mobile operator can offer this kind of installment plan immediately because they have got wide uh, franchisee network and customer centers. So there's no issue. I mean, if there is a default on part of the customer, the PTA can block immediately. 
plus other uh, companies they intend to offer a plan for uh, offering the mobile phone and installment they can check the credit rating and they can immediately start offering the phones and if that phone keeps keeps ownership name with them they can come to pta and pta can block immediately plus on top of that there is a uh, not all the population is covered uh, with 4G services. So if we want to transform and we want to attract the 4G customers, so mobile operator have to expand their footprints so that uh, the facility of 4G services can easily be available. So I think these are the, these three points. If we work, um, I mean, efficiently on those so we can overcome the challenges and we can uh, quickly transform the uh, 2G segment into the 4G segment. Okay, Asif? Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to add that actually uh, it's not just about the operator giving a subsidized phone and the regulator blocking it when I ask them to. I'm down $30. And uh, yes, you can block the handset. That doesn't add any value to me because I'm down $30. Anybody off the street can walk in and take a handset and no, never pay again. We actually have no credit scoring facility or mechanism. And then there is no retort onto the customer. I know in other more mature markets, the customer is prevented from getting another bank account, another loan account, whatever they've defaulted on, they will not be able to get any more financing going forward. In a country where banking population is very low, we have to look at much more creative solutions to be able to provide uh, the actual repayment to the customer. And hence we are working now with Finja and other entities as such. Thank you. Abdul? Yes, so uh, I think just like Asif earlier mentioned that we are right now in the era of, you know, a broadband emergency. So we actually have to see how to improve the overall internet penetration. And for this, uh, all the, you know, public and private stakeholders have to come together and, you know, uh, work towards a direction where we can actually you know, remove the barrier of affordability. Device financing program I would like to add that it can have an immediate impact on the improvement of affordability factor. And, you know, uh, we, we, we can easily migrate people from 2G to 4G. But again, you know, uh, one major role is uh, uh, lies with the regulator, which is again PTA here. And, you know, they have to safeguard the financing of the financier uh, by blocking the, you know, the, the phone and along with the phone, the SIM cards so that the defaulter actually is not able to use any SIM card or any telecom service in Pakistan. And this is where you know, the financier will be happy to invest in the country. So, uh, I mean, we, we are already seeing that, you know, those customers who are using our current phones uh, on KaiOS, they're consuming huge data, about 5 GB. So this clearly shows that there is a huge demand. All we have to do is to make sure that these products are affordable for everyone. Thank you. Okay, Chauhan. Yes, I think I'll just like to echo what everyone else is saying uh, over here as well. Uh, you know, there is, uh, from a lending perspective, uh, if a customer does default, we are able to blacklist that uh, individual uh, on data check or the regulatory ECIB. But, uh, but you know, uh, for device financing, I think uh, I strongly feel that uh, uh, having that individual not be able to obtain another SIM card from any other operator is something that will always be on the top of mind for that particular individual. And again, you know, in, in the private sector, we have a lot of collaborations. We work with, uh, we work with each other, the, you know, the various non-competes that we do uh, as it is, but at the government level, you have one national account, uh, accountability and database regulatory authority who control the, the national identity card. Now that ID card is not just used to purchase or uh, registered to a SIM card, but that's also used to open a bank account or obtain a loan. So at that level, at the government level, if the ministries can somehow collaborate and block it on the CNIC level, which is a computerized national identity card, at that time, it's very easy for financiers and service providers and operators to actually ring fence that credit facility so that we can start scaling and the borrowers know that should they default, what lies ahead is something which is completely in the stone ages. So, so yeah, so I mean, you know, we're happy to lend, we're happy to 
extend this facility uh, for the betterment of digitizing the country and the population at large is a huge opportunity as mentioned in the panel uh, discussion already. But uh, again, a key element is what do we do if an individual runs away? Because I completely second what Asif said earlier as well, that the financial is down $30 what do you do if the guy is never showing, showing up and he goes to another operator and gets another SIM card or another telephone and does that time and again. So, you know, it's, it's, it's our NPL from a financing perspective that goes up, uh, which does not make any economical sense to finance in this segment going forward. Okay, thank you very much. And as a conclusion on my side, uh, at KOS, we are very happy to be uh, providing the uh, operating system as well as the locking mechanism uh, and to be working with uh, all these partners to make this happen. We just, uh, we just started. We are about to have uh, uh, devices with these lock mechanisms coming to the market, and it's, uh, it's an exciting journey. So thank you, everyone. I think now we have time for a couple of questions in the Q&A. Um, I think there's a question for you, Asif about the acquisition of customers. Do you want to, to take this, this question? Sure. Uh, yes, let me just come in here. Sure, yes. Yeah, so uh, we've, we've, uh, we've extended our uh, growth over the last few years. So, you know, at the end of 20, uh, 2019, we were just about 60 million subscribers. At the end of 2020, we were 66 million subscribers. And now we're about to be 69 and a half. Yes, a lot of it is coming from new customers, but actually our great job has been on the retention. We have a very good churn rate in the industry. It's around 18 percentage points for a prepaid market that is leading, but we've got a very data analytical led uh, retention policy. So I've got a whole bunch of data scientists who sit behind there uh, and actually work out new algorithms and models to be able to serve the customer's needs uh, more closely. And as a result of that, I believe the engagement levels that we've had with our customer is what they're actually wanting. And of course, uh, a churn rate like that indicates that the products that you're providing are what consumers need. And uh, the Jazz Cash platform is one something that's very important. Many of our customers also have the financial services services from us as well. Perfect. I think there's one more question that just popped up. Uh, I think it's a question for you, uh, Abdul, is what is the role of taxation Maybe Abdul and or Asif, there's a, what's the role of taxation and the device affordability in Pakistan? Um, let me start uh, with that before I run. I think uh, there is something here on taxation that we probably haven't covered, but I, I do believe that one of Pakistan's telecoms market is quite heavily taxed. When an individual purchases a SIM uh, a card, they are taxed on the card and then they are taxed again on the usage. And I, I think things like that are quite prohibitive. About 18 months ago, the government did reduce uh, through a legal perspective um, taxation, and we saw usage increase quite dramatically at that particular time, so much so that we had to actually build a significant amount of extra capacity to be able to serve consumer needs. So that shows you the appetite and the demand there that we have from consumers' perspective, and also from a taxation. Yes, there are taxations on handsets, but I do believe there should be extra relief uh, to be able to upgrade from 2G to 4G. And I think conversely, uh, I know it may sound perverse, but I would tax 2G even more to be able to discourage it. I know that might go against everything and it's maybe the poorest of society who need the 2G phones, but we need to discourage 2G. That is a 1990s technology. We're in 2020 now. We need to encourage 4G adoption. Thank you. Um, I think I'm uh, going to leave the uh, the floor back to Wissis. Uh, they have a, a closing video, and uh, before the video starts, I'd like to thank everyone on the panel here, as well as all the attendees, for being with us for this last hour. Thank you very much. Thank you.